James chapter 2, verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Different churches have taken different attitudes towards this. You'll hear people, they think that when, when they ask Jesus to save them, and then they got baptized, that that was it. They're done. And, or they got the, and then they spoke in tongues. And so that's the end of it. They, they don't see any reason or need for, to be fed spiritually. And this is not true. And this is what James is going to deal with. And we've said this before about James. He shoots straight. He doesn't, uh, you know, like in Billard, you, you, you shoot at the cushion and bounce the ball. and He doesn't do that. Just dead straight right in, right? <clears throat> and that's what he does, straight to the point. I think I said before, he calls an ace an ace. What doth it profit? What possible profit could there be, though a man say he has faith, but he has no works? Can faith save him? Now, most of the people, most of your pastors, if you're not reading out of the Bible here, if you said, well, if a guy has faith, but he doesn't show any type of works, can he be saved? Can faith, can that faith save him? And they will say, sure, he, he was saved by faith. It's not of works. And yet straight here, James nailed it right here. You have to have works. Now, those works could be all different kinds of things for us. Uh, but primarily, the things that he's going to deal with here are, are pretty much eye-openers. Some of the things are, that you, the Lord would have you to do are unique to you, and God gave you talents and, and gifts to do that. And you need to do that. You need to step out. You need to use your, your gifts in that capacity. But don't ignore these other things. What other things? Let's see here. Verse 15. So here's his picture. He's showing a man that says he has faith, but he doesn't have works. So the, can this faith save him? And he's going to show you by illustration. He says, verse 15. If a, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food. So what do they need? Food and clothing. Food and clothing. The most basic needs, and we're, we all need that. Right? If we're going to live, first we need food, and second, if, especially if you're living up here, you need some type of clothing or you freeze to death. Or fry. Or die or fry. Yeah. So uh, these are the things, these are basic needs. So he says here, if, if you, you say you have faith, you come up to a, a brother or a sister and they are completely without clothing and without food. And so one of you says to them, depart in peace. Be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? That word needful is absolutely, there's no two ways about it. It's talking about their physical requirements of their body, right? Can you imagine the gall of somebody to, to, to have the capacity or have the wherewithal in, the, in their wallet to help someone out? So it says, and it says you, a brother or sister. It's not even talking about somebody, you know, that you don't know. This is... Somebody, somebody that you would know. You, you know he's a brother or sister in the, char in the church, right? But he doesn't have any food. He doesn't have any clothing. Who knows what happened? Maybe they lost their house. This happens to people. They lose their job. The next thing, they're losing their family because they're getting divorced because right. now there's no income and there's no food and there's no clothing. They don't get enough help. We should do what we can. He says if a brother or sister is destitute... And you can help them, then you should help them. You're calling yourself a Christian. And what should drive you? Not because you are afraid not to help them, because of compassion and because you have the love of God inside you. 
Now, maybe, maybe you don't have the love of God inside you. Maybe you need to work on it. There's a lot of things that we, we need to say, maybe I need to work on this. I think the main thing is not to get into condemnation, but to say, Lord, help me do better and, and not ignore it. Not, not, not try to brush it off and say, well, that's for someone else. I mean, it goes back to that first verse. He said, can faith alone save him? Where do you think all this negative stuff comes from? Spirits. Spirits, Unfortunately, there's a whole bunch of people in the church today that don't even believe in demonic spirits. They're still here. I heard people say, well, you know, the demons were there in Jesus' day, but he cast them out. He cast them into some pigs. The pigs went over a cliff. And where do you think the demons went? They came out looking for somebody else. Those demons are still around this on this earth, right? Oh, no, they fell and they got hurt and they died. No, they didn't fall and hurt. You can't kill them. You can't kill them. And you know Jesus didn't send them to the pit, to the abyss yet, because they said, have you can't come to torment us before the time? And Jesus, and he didn't do it. They knew right. there was a time of judgment. They had, they have a, as long as they don't disobey him when he commands them. So he told, he says, get out of the pit, you know, get out of him. And then they have the nerve to say, can we go into the swine? Mm-hmm. And you would think. They have to be some living, you know. They want to live in a body, in a body. because they can't, they can't feel. Right. They can't see. They can't, you know, whatever they are, they, they want to inhabit a body, which leads me to believe that at one time they did have bodies. If brother or sister be naked, destitute of food, and one of you said, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Now, how are they going to do that? Depart in peace. You can't have peace when your, your basic need is not satisfied of, of food. You got hunger pains. You're naked. Um, if you're in that situation, your children are. And uh, one of you says, depart in peace, be warm, filled. Notwithstanding, you, you give them not those things which are needful to the body. What does it profit? Absolutely, it profits zero, right? Okay, so this person doesn't have any, any works to go along with his faith. He may be thinking he's living the life, but he's, he's earning a big zero here, right? His witness is a zero. Uh, verse 17, even so, now if you didn't get it the first time, when he, when, he, when he puts it like, well, can faith alone save him? Then he says this, he says, verse 17, even, even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead. Now, we all know what dead is, yeah. Right? When you, with death, I mean, if it wasn't for Adam and Eve, we wouldn't know about death. But death means you're, you don't exist anymore. At least, at least when you die as a, as a human being, your soul still is alive, but your body's dead. It's, it ceases to function in this earth, right? And so death, the idea of dead is ceasing to have any impact. And so faith, if it, is, if it doesn't have works... It has absolutely no impact on this world. So, it's, again, it's a big zero. Verse 18, yea, a man say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by thy works, or by my works. So the one guy saying, I have faith, but I don't have any works. And the other guy's saying, I have the works. And the reason I have the works is because I got the faith. And I think this verse, if we lift it, lift this one verse out and put it in the setting of the judgment day. Do you remember when, when G, see, if you're called by the name of Christ, if you're a Christian, you will go to the Bema Seat of Christ where he will judge you for the works in this body, right? What if he says to you, I don't see any evidence that you had faith. And your response is, 
What do you mean I didn't have any faith? I did this, I did that, I did... He said, no, he said, you didn't do those works for me. You didn't have any works that I called you to do. Remember Jesus said, many will come in my name, saying, didn't I do this? Didn't I do that? He'll say, I never knew you. That could be his response. It's got to go deeper than that. It's got to go deeper than you doing something because you're getting something in return. The whole essence is give, right? Give. Think of life as you're going through life, this Christian life, as you're under a trial or you're under a test. And there will be a court case and the judge will be looking to see if there's any evidence to convict you. Do you have evidence to convict you of being a Christian? Let's, let's say that you were pulled in front of Caesar in the Roman Empire. And they say, you know, they, they were feeding those guys to the lions, right? Well, he tells the Roman soldiers, Do, is there any evidence that, that these guys are Christian? Because I'm not going to just feed anybody the lion. Would they be able to find evidence of your life? Point to would, would some somebody be able to point to something and say, "Look, he did this. He's obviously a Christian." Maybe or throughout the entire life, or points here and there where he was good. Well, I don't think it, I, I don't think anybody's continually good ever. I think we all miss it. But I, I do think that the, your life should have representative evidences of times that you did things that God told you to do or God called you to do. James is exposing. He's exposing us here. So, you know, if he exposes you, don't let anybody know and nobody won't know if that he's talking about you, Right? But don't get so hung up. Don't ignore it and don't deny it. Go to God and, and, and tell, you know, God, God knows what you did or what you're doing, right? And that's, I mean, that's where we're at. And I'll tell you, I don't know how people live the, or continue to live in their Christian faith without studying the word or without getting into the word. Because I'm telling you, it's the only thing that keeps me on this end of the fence. <laughs> Does good works involve, uh, you know, basically seducing children into false idolatry and false holidays and whatnot? No. All these things we should be abstaining from. It's a one-on-one thing. When it all gets down to it, Brandon's not going to be there when Victor's judged. You will have an accuser. You will have a prosecuting attorney, right? And he will be bringing the evidence against you. So Jesus is your advocate. He's your advocate and he's also your judge. But he's going to want evidence that you are a Christian, that you did live for him. And that's what this is about here. He says in verse 19, he said, Thou believest that there is one God. Now, have you heard people say this? Oh, yeah, I believe in God. Yeah, well, they, want, they want to blow you off. They want you to do that. I believe in God. In fact, there's some people, you know, like I've talked to Muslims. They say, well, I believe in the one God, one true God. It's the same God of Abraham, but they don't believe, they have a problem with Jesus as the Son of God, or Jesus is, is deity, right? You've got the Jews, they rejected their Messiah, but yeah, you say, well, we believe in God. Yeah. You know, that's not, according to James, that's not anything, that's no cover. There's no cover of protection when the eyes of judgment are going over your life. He says, you believe there's one God, you do well. The devils also believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't you think the demons and the the devil, when it says devils, it's actually demons. Mm -hmm. These spirits of Satan, they know God exists. Uh, Mm -hmm. Satan knows God exists. And it says, not only do they know, do they believe, they tremble. And that word, it's not like, you know, you just shake a little. It's a a terrible shuddering of of, uh, uh, 
great fear. fear right. Great fear. There's so much fear that you, it's, it's like you, you don't know what you're going to do. You're just going to burst out of fear. In fact, Paul did say, they call him the God of this world. Yeah, so how yeah. many people follow him? That. Over half the world. Most of the world. <laughs> you worship the God of the world or the God of the heavens? Well, I would even say this. Don't say you worship the God of heavens. Tell me you worship the God of this book. See, because one thing God said, don't have any false images that you're bound down to. If you've got a false Jesus, if you're, if you're believing in a false Jesus, that's, that's an idol. That's not God. That's not God's son. If your Jesus don't look like this picture, you got some picture you bought at the Walmart. And you think Jesus looked like that? No! Jesus looks like what's in this book. Jesus looks like what James is is telling you to be, and you're supposed to be conformed to the image of his son. What does that mean? You're supposed to be like him. You're supposed to be conformed. And yes, we we all need some work on that. Then he says after that, verse 20, But will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Now, it sounds like something we've heard before in this same chapter. He calls the man vain. Foolish. Okay, vain is foolish. Can be, it could be translated foolish. Um, I, always, I always think of it this way. Uh, we have a checking account. And sometimes you write the check and then you say, oh, I screwed that up, right? So what you put a, write a four-letter word on it. Void. Okay, and it's not a curse word. Void. Exactly. Vain and void basically is the same thing. And he's saying, you are foolish, you are, you're suffering under your own deceptive vanity, and your life is being made void because of sin. God impressed this upon me a long time ago, but I have problems retaining it. It comes, it comes and goes, you know. But sin is a cancer. The best way you can liken sin is it's a cancer. Now think about this. You, so you go to church, you hear the gospel, you get saved, you get baptized. If you had cancer, would you ignore it? Or would you get, would you get that cancer taken care of? You just don't go to church and go get baptized. You got cancer inside you, and we all got it. And the only one can remove it. This has to be removed spiritually. And what does what what is the result of sin? Death. 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 Right. Same thing. What's the result of cancer? If left to itself, cancer will kill you. I don't care if it's cancer of your elbow. It'll eventually eat you. If we equated sin with death, we may be more successful in our walk. And now he's going to, again, give an illustration about being justified by works. Let's go. He's going to talk about Abraham. He says, was not Abraham our father justified by works? When he offered Isaac his son upon the altar. Let's, we'll come back here. Let's go to Genesis 22. Start at verse 1. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto Abraham, and he said, or said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, clayed the wood for the burnt offering, rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. And and you, you probably have heard this story many times, but just bear with me here. Uh, the reason you've heard it is because it's an important, it's a real important passage or chapter. And Abraham said to his young men, Abide here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. 
Now, what was Abraham called to do? Sacrifice his son. Sacrifice his son. A burnt offering, right? He got the, he got the wood, he got the, the fire, he, he, he got what he needed. He even had some, uh, some rope to tie him up. But he says here, I and the lad will go yonder. I'm going to go over there. You stay here. We're going to go worship God. And then we're going to come back to you again. We're going to come back. In other words, you're going to see my son. But God told him he's going to be burned to ashes. His faith was in operation. He knew this was his only begotten son. He knew that his whole future generations depends upon this child living. So he knows, based upon the promise of God, nothing else, he knows that God is not going to leave Isaac dead. Right? That's, that's what he knows. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. He took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I. He actually probably said like this, My father. He said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire, or look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? So it shows Isaac was familiar with burnt offerings. He's like, Well, where's the, where's the sacrifice? Abraham says, My God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them together. And that verse 8 is one of the most powerful prophetic utterances regarding the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That spoke of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, didn't it? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them together, and they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son. See, he tied him up. He laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and he took the knife to slay his son. This man was serious. He wasn't backing down. That knife. Now, he didn't. God didn't tell him to to cut his son with a knife. He told him offer him up as a burnt offering. But the way you did that is you cut the animal by the jugular and let the blood come out first. That's what he was going to do to his son. Take this into our day, into a courtroom situation. Well, this, the, you know, the, the prosecuting attorney said, you're going to tell me God told you to take your son? Whip out a knife and God's going to raise him from the dead. Can you imagine? You and I would have thought Abraham was nuts. But see, the, he, knew, he knew what he knew. That's faith, by the way. See, faith is not supposing. It's not you suppose this is true. When you have faith, you have faith in the promise of God, the Word of God. If you have faith, you know it's true. There's no supposing. Now, sometimes you don't get what you, the way things, the way you would like them to be. You know, you don't get everything that you ask for. You don't, every, all, your life is not exactly perfect in, in what it should be. Maybe if we lived a more perfect life, maybe our life would be. I don't know. But he says here, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them together, and they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order, bound his son, laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And I said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son from me. And that, that's, a, that's a big loaded verse there. Because you notice he said, Now I know you fear God. And it's a reverential fear. 
It's, it's, it's the fear that comes from true faith in God. So now I, basically he's saying, now I know you believe. You know, before you, you could have just been uh, uh, getting close. But now you've been tested. Now you're willing to give me your only son who's all hope of future generations. Everything I promise you rests on that child. And you're willing to offer it up to me. Knowing that by doing that, you're kissing away everything in life. Abraham, he had other children. He did, but he had Ishmael, but Ishmael was, was cast out because uh, God, the Spirit, said he will not have a part in, this, uh, in, in the inheritance. And see, this is where the Muslims have a problem. Because they think, if you read the Koran, and I don't advise it, but if you do, you'll find out Ishmael is in there. And they say Ishmael was the sacrifice, not Isaac. And from that point on, they're so, well, it's actually the whole thing's so messed up. They have, I mean, they have accounts of Jesus. They have accounts of Mary. They have accounts of Ishmael and, oh, you know, Noah and Adam and Eve. And everything is like, let's just say everything's backwards. So he's, so he's been proved and he says, seeing thou hast not withheld thine own... I, like, I love the, 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 you have not withhold your son, your only son from me. And now many people have pointed this out, but it comes right out of the Bible. Abraham was willing to give his only son. How could God do any less? It was a foreshadowing of that. Right? And it was a foreshadowing yeah. of God giving his only begotten son. Now, there are some people that say today, well, Jesus is no longer the only begotten son, but he is. Nobody is equivalent to Jesus. And I know that the scripture says that, that we, we, God has many sons and daughters. You know, we're the first, we're the church of the firstborn. Right? We're the first fruits, plural. But Jesus is unique. He was the only begotten son of God before he was even born, right? He was the word made flesh when he came to, to this earth. But before that, he wasn't the word made flesh. He was the word. So Abraham lifted up his eyes in verse 13. He looked and behold him, a ram was caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered up uh, for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. If you've heard that song before, Jehovah Jireh. And what does it mean? Well, Jehovah is the provider. Okay, that's what it means. So the place was called Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. In other words, remember Abraham said, God will provide himself the lamb. And that's where you get the Jehovah Jireh from. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thy... And I love how he keeps coming back. He doesn't say you didn't withheld thy son, thy only son. He, then he, comma, thy only son. He recognized this is your only begotten. In blessing I will bless thee, in multiplying I will multiply thee, as the seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Well, did you know Jesus, when he died, he went, descended, and he possessed the gate of his enemy? Because his enemy was death, right? Did you know nobody has to die? Nobody has to die and go into hell and be cut off from God. You don't die because of Adam's sin anymore. That's been taken care of. You don't, you don't die because of your parents' sin. You don't die of your own sin if you would just go to Jesus and get straightened out. But for some reason, we got this block. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to humble myself and ask to be saved. Or we go the other route. We, we ask God to save us, but then we won't allow him to change our life. And we just read in James, faith without works is dead. 
you know, you shouldn't be comfortable going to church. Maybe if you're comfortable coming to church, maybe it's time to heat it up. Right? Right? I mean, I love when God, he uses his, he uses his word to chastise us. He uses his word to say, you know, like I'll use myself as an example. God would be the first one to say, you know, like if I went home and I said, you know, Lord, I did a bang up job tonight, preaching the word, teaching the word. You know what God would say? You didn't do such a bang up job on those sins that you haven't, you've been ignoring. Don't tell me about that stuff until you do this stuff. And see, even though you have, you may have works, it's not enough. Think of that, that person who was, who was naked and without clothing and you gave him clothes and then, and, and, and you gave him food and you gave him clothes and then you go out to a, a porn house or something. Yeah. You know, do they still they still have them, right? I'm asking you guys because maybe you would know. No, you can you can see them as you're driving down the. the usually they're on a billboard, right? No, I think they still. I, I think they do still have them, but now I'm going to go to verse 17 here. That in blessing, and now God is saying, in blessing, I will bless thee and multiply, and I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, as the sand which is upon the seashore. Now, where are the stars? In heaven. Where's the sand? On the shore. On the seashore. On the earth. Right? And he's talking about, he says, I will bless thee, I will multiply thy seed. And you don't have to accept this, but I believe he's talking about two different seeds. I believe right there he's saying some of you will, go, will, will, will have a heavenly calling. And those are the ones in Christ. And other ones, they're gonna, he, he will have a millennial kingdom also. He'll have a kingdom on this earth. People that don't go into rapture but make it through the tribulation... There will be a judgment and then they will go, some people will go into that millennial kingdom and the Bible says that they will live for a thousand years, or more than a thousand years and they will have babies and then their babies will have babies and they'll be living on the earth. But I don't believe that they ever will get to where the church is. This is like a one-time invitation. You, you know, he, he told the story about... Uh, uh, people being invited to the wedding. And, and a lot of them said, or most people said, you know, I, I got to do this, or I got to get a new cow. Or Could you imagine you don't go to the rapture because you wanted to go buy a new cow? Whatever, right? So, uh, and verse 18 says, in, in your seed... And I believe the seed. Am I the seed of Abraham? Are you the seed of Abraham? Yeah. So he's talking about us. Usually when we say the seed of Abraham, we're talking about Israel, right? In thy seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. They'll be blessed because of Israel. Because Israel is the one that gave us the Old Testament. They're, and and he gave us, they gave us the Messiah. They gave us the apostles, right? Now, I'm not trying to say that God didn't give us the Messiah, but, you know, it all came from there. So the whole world has been blessed, just like God said right here. And none of this would have happened. Jump back to James. Verse, James chapter 2, verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? When he offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar. Seest thou how faith worked with works? And by works was faith made perfect? And that word perfect is actually, it doesn't mean perfect like you think perfect. It means complete. 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 It went from one play, one point to the other, and now it's complete. In other words, it accomplished what he sent it forth to accomplish. But if Abraham wouldn't have had the works, 
Let's say Abraham didn't take his son up the mountain. Abraham didn't put his son. Abraham's thinking, you know, that night he's tossing and turning in his bed. Should I do this? Should I do this? And, and he has dreams. And he says, no, God would never tell me to offer up my son. But he knew God told him. And he, he knew what God said, and he did it. And that's what we're reading here. He said he had, he, he showed how faith was uh, wrought with his works. By works was faith made perfect, or he completed his mission. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. And that is a very powerful verse there, too. Because it is this verse that appears in Romans that says that it's by faith that righteousness is imputed to us who have faith in Christ because if you are Christ's seed, then you're Abraham's seed. And so you have, you have faith just like he had. And, and the faith, Abraham believed God, it was imputed unto him for righteousness. He was called a friend of God. In other words, he, righteousness means you have now have right standing with God. That's a good deal. But you know, it's, it's another point. It says, and he was called the friend of God. Now, have you heard, uh, we sing that song sometimes, I am a friend of God. But you know what? I don't think we, we can all sing that, and I don't think that we can all sing that any time we want to. Because being a friend of God means you're doing what he said. How can you be a friend of God if you're not doing what he said? Jesus did say, you are my friend if you do what I command you. It's not obey. It's I command you. So John 15. And 13, right? 13. Okay, we'll go to 13. We'll read that too. Everybody there? John 15, 13. Greater love has no man than this that a man laid down his life for his friends. Who laid down his life for his friends? Jesus Jesus did. Look at verse 12. This is my commandment. This is not Moses' commandment. This is my commandment. Do you think we better pay attention? We should. He said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. What does the word as mean? Like, right? Do what I did. And what does it say here? Greater love has, hath no man than this lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. So next time you are in church and they start singing, I am a friend of God. I am a friend. You stand up and say, How many of you are doing what he commanded you to do? And if you're not, you better not be singing that song. Now, I know we're not, I'm not telling you to do that. It's a self-examination, exactly. But God is bringing that to our attention here tonight because it goes along with with, um, this idea. Abraham was called a friend. Why? He did what he was commanded to do. You can't be a friend of God and refuse to obey. Right? And this is why people don't like to hear this. James, back to James chapter 2, verse 223. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, or what we said, a right standing with God. And he was called the friend of God because of his obedience, right? You see that how that by works a man is justified and not by faith. And then we got Rahab. Now, do you, I'm not going to go to Rahab, the story, but because I know you, you've heard it not too long ago. Who was Rahab? She was a former prostitute. She was a former prostitute. She, was, she put the, let the told the messengers 
that the people were gone and told sent them in the wrong direction and let them out the window. But okay, so she obviously she helped out, say, basically preserved their life, right? Anything else about Rianne? She's a grandmother. She she is a grandmother, yeah, of Jesus. Anything else? Okay, let's, let's read it here. So it all had to do with Jericho, didn't it? Likewise also, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? What if Rahab would have received the messengers and didn't help them? Probably would have got killed. What good would it have done? Right? What if she, what if she said, I believe in God. Would that have helped? No. I believe that God has given you the city. Does that help? No, these guys are going to be dead. The only thing that helps is she, she takes her faith and she moves on her faith. And that's what it's saying here. She sent them out another way. So she was justified by her work. And then it concludes this whole principle. He says, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now think, think, about, um, think about a human body at the point of death. That's what it's talking about. So when, as, a, as a body without the spirit is dead. After death, what does your body do? Decompose. Decomposes. Your toenails grow. Your hair grows. Your your face deteriorates until you can see your false teeth through the skin. If you dug, you know, I mean, if you dug somebody up, eventually you'll turn to ashes. You know, people say, "Well, is it wrong to be, you know, incinerated instead of buried?" Well, you're going to be ashes anyway. Right, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. So, I had a big problem. You had a big problem with that. I had it for years because I always looked at it that it was a pagan thing to cremate. That's where it started Mm -hmm. from paganism. And then I always looked at they always respect the body by burying the body. Yeah. So that's how I looked at it: it's a respect, a form of respect. But knowing truth, the body is gone. You know, so when you think of it now, the way society is, is, you know, why are you paying all that money to have a service for one hour, burial, spend all that money. Spend fifteen, twenty thousand dollars for a casket. A casket that they say that they can seal in the water, you know, which is a lie. <laughs> you know. And they say they buried that person in that casket. Yeah, How do you know it's not a dishwasher right. box? Right. And I, it could be a cardboard box. So if your body falls dead, will you be out in the morning riding your bike? Will you be out taking a walk? You won't be out at all. You, there's nothing you can... You won't be cooking food. You won't be watching television. He's saying just like if you take a body... We're, we're, the reason he's saying it is we're all familiar. They were familiar all the way back then. We're all familiar when you die, the spirit... It says, without the spirit, when the spirit leaves, your body's dead. Everybody's going to die, one way or the other. When that spirit leaves, you're dead. As far as your earthly life, your earthly body here, right? And then he uses that as an illustration. He says, so faith without works is dead also. Which he's already told us several times. But this is the concluding verse here. Faith without works is dead. You can't even be saved without works because first you have to know the free word. Then you have to believe the word. You do it. Then you have to <laughs> repent. And then you have to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. Then you're either water baptized, and some people believe you have to be filled with the Spirit. You don't have to be filled with the Spirit to be saved. But you have to live a faithful life. You can't. You have to keep doing all those things over and over. Right. You have to keep reading the word. You have to keep believing the word. You have to keep repenting. You have to keep confessing. You have to constantly do those things all the time. And those are works right there. And you know that that actually is a really good point because you know when it talks about 
in the in the Greek, when it says you should, sometimes it says this. Jesus said, "You should ask and keep on asking," but you don't see it in the English. But that's what it says. You should ask, like he says, "Ask and you shall receive." But he says, "Ask and keep on asking." Pray, keep on praying, right? Well, repent and that, keep on repenting. If you just ask for one thing and then you like, oh, God, I can't ask for anything. No, keep asking for everything you need. You know? Everything you need. You Remember need. in the temple, they had the morning and evening sacrifice. Yeah. Daily, twice a day. Should be more than that, they got me around. It would it would have a uh, impact on your life and my life and all of our lives if we took that and said, okay, I'm going to start the day with God and end the day with God. That's a good principle to live by. You've got to form the habit. 